Chapter 6 Breaking the Cycle For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on the tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Galatians 3, 10 through 14. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Galatians 5, 24. It is not enough merely to forgive. The existence of our undead flesh guarantees that we will repeat many of our offenses far more than 490 times, Matthew 18, 21, and 22. If you will picture a prize fighter deftly warding off blows through countless rounds defending against a relentless attacker, that may begin to portray the incessant need of forgiveness in a family so long as the flesh is not dealt with. See, don't we all at times feel like martyrs who seem to have to do all the forgiving in the family and become dreadfully impatient for God to change everyone else? Habitual structures inflict so continually that they may eventually wear out the most patient saint. Therefore the cross is central to survival. For Christ's blood washes away guilt for past hatreds. But only when we let it take us a step further and die with him on the cross is future hate prevented. Repentance is not a feeling, it is an action. It will not effect much change if we only feel sorry. Listen, change happens in relationships solely as the cycle of hatred is broken and transformed by the stimuli of love. Change can happen in individuals one by one only in relationships. Change happens in individuals only as those structures that stimulate wrong actions and that respond to them are crucified on the cross. Without that crucifixion, battle scenes will be repeated in endlessly varied forms. Many believers attempt to heal relationships by changing the surface ways people talk or act. Since all words and actions have behind them rivers of inner intention and hidden structures in the flesh, that is much like sticking a finger in a dike only to discover another break and then another and then another and then another. Eventually, one pictures a man splayed over a wall with every finger and toe engaged, while emotions and incidents pour like a sieve all around him until the whole relationship burst open. By becoming as us in Gethsemane, our Lord Jesus gained the right necessitated by our free will to die for us as us on the cross. See, 
that death crumbles the structures of self. The moment our physical body dies, the vacated spirit no longer has access to sustain its structures and collapse and decay set in. See, the moment the attitude of our hearts find its death nailed on the cross, the structures it sustained begin to find their death on the cross. In each such successive inner death, we go through a process, one modeled for us by the forerunner and pioneer of our faith as he died and arose again. Like Jesus, after a while, three days in the belly of the earth, a new and resurrected spirit in us fills that old, newly dead structure with a new and transformed intention that can move through locked doors and windows. John 20, 19 through 26, to meet and heal the hearts of others. See, when death of a character structure happens, that portion of our inner being figuratively sinks into the heart of the earth. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 12, 40. In biblical symbolism, the belly is the repository of thoughts and feelings. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John 7, 38. Death of a portion of ourself initiates a convulsion or deep shudder throughout our interior being. Such death is made sweet as the overwhelming presence of Jesus envelops our hearts as we receive his healing touch. However, sometimes the opposite seems to occur, at least initially. When the heat of the Holy Spirit drives hidden dross to the surface of our hearts, Malachi 3.2, the purging can bring temporary discomfort. In such instances, we may undergo, excuse me, in such instances, we may undergo sadness, confusion, disorientation, despondency, heaviness, sleepiness, or turmoil. In that time, death is happening throughout the subterranean regions of our motives and practices. See, truly we also, like Jesus, spend our three days in the belly of the earth. The three days may be but for a moment, or hours, or days, or in rare cases, weeks, depending on who knows what within the complexity of us. I have visited with many believers during their three days. They may say any number of the following things. I don't know what's happening to me. I'm so tired all the time. I feel so heavy, I feel like I'm drugged. I don't seem to want to do anything. I don't seem to have my normal, usual feeling. I'm walking around like a zombie. I feel like a bowl of jelly inside. I'm all scrambled. I feel like an inner earthquake is rumbling around somewhere and I can't get a hold of it. I just want to sleep all the time. You never told me it would be like this. How long does this go on? Is this normal? The most common experience is extremely heavy fatigue. Actually, what has happened is similar to what occurs in the first days of a much needed vacation. 
When we let down, our fatigue catches up with us. The weariness is not actually new. It was there all along. Our letting down causes us to feel accumulated past fatigue in the present. See, Jesus came to call the weary. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my load is light. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Every structure in the flesh is marked by unrest. Whatever in us that has been built by God is at rest, even as he rested. Hebrews 4, 10. Whatever we built in us, whatever we built in us has no rest. It must be constantly examined, reworked, defended, appreciated, and approved of. Thus, each practice demands energy to sustain itself. That is why sometimes our conscious mind forgets what it is doing. Our inner struggle robs the surface mind of its ability to concentrate by draining off its energy for more demanding inner battles. See, So when we come to death with Jesus on the cross, our inner being goes into the tomb with him and we let down into that emotional, mental, and spiritual fatigue that was there all the time. As we said earlier, however, such discomfort is the exception and not the rule. But we have lingered on the subject for the sake of those who may be experiencing such feelings and wonder what is happening to them. In any case, that time of inner death cannot be hastened. Like Jesus, we need our three days in the belly of the earth, however long or short that may be. We also need our Joseph and Nicodemus to be there as we come off the cross of death to lay us lovingly to rest. Matthew 27, 58 and 59. That means practically that we need people who can stand for us to change, people who are not threatened if we act differently or, or fail to act, people who stand by us, not forcing us to return to the old ways of acting, people who do nothing but stand there accepting us as we stop doing what is familiar to them. People who are not upset because we don't play the old games anymore. We need people who do not demand that we respond out of the old emotional center that is no longer there. Who are not hurt, accusing, or controlling. People who let us be a dead mess and love us anyway. We also need people like the Roman centurion and his soldiers, people who stand guard about us through the long night of our death. We cannot take the full clamor of new events and challenges during the time of inner death. We need people to pick up the slack for us to handle details and not criticize when we flub a detail we used to do easily by rote. We need a pocket like a quarterback defending on his guards to pick off the blitzers, listen, long enough for the play of life to unfold in a new way before us. There is an inner night of death we need to have time to go through. We may not be ready quickly to be touched like Jesus with Mary in the garden. John 20, 17, as Jesus needed to go yet to his father, so we may need quiet confirmations of the new life until it settles in. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. 1 Peter 5.10
and people may not recognize us. John 20, 14 and Luke 24, 16. They are not used to the new us, see, and neither are we. So the old familiar demands upon us need to be held off for a while. Another analogy might be that we are like a newly overhauled motor that should not be run full bore until the new piston rings are well sealed. We need to ease into the new old body of us. If hurried, we may not come into the fullness of rest and new identity we are meant to become. See? A. Allow the hiddenness of the process. There is a hiddenness that ought to be respected. No one knows what happened to Jesus during those three days in the tomb. We know what he did, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19 but we do not know what kind of metamorphosis, if any, was happening to him or how. We know that he was made perfect through what he suffered. Hebrews 2.10 Perhaps that perfection was continuing to be accomplished there in the depths of suffering our death. Unless it is finished referred as well to the process. Whether or not anything was continuing to happen to Jesus, it certainly does happen in us in our three days in the belly of the earth. For that time, introspection needs to stop. In prayer ministry, I have often felt the check of the Holy Spirit prompting me to tell the person to quit looking in for that time period. The Lord at such times would reveal nothing further concerning the inner nature of the person to whom I may have been ministering and would make it apparent to me that this was not the time to deal with anything else already seen inside the person. Other things might later come to a time of death, but right then so much death and deep hidden reformation was going on that we only wanted to sit and celebrate, seeing nothing further, see. We have often had to say to the person, will you quit digging up the seed to see how well it's doing and let well enough alone. Our holy spiritual advice then is to suggest the person read a mystery novel, watch a comedy program or movie or play a game, anything to busy the mind outwardly, distracting it from interior speculation so as to let the inner being alone. How significant it is that Jesus came back into the same physically wounded body. Apart from all the theological significances which could never be overstated, there lies an import to the inner being that is the essence of transformation. Our own new nature likewise arises within the very structure of what we have been. It is not that we would be okay if we could just get away from ourselves and move over there somewhere else and become some other personality. Maybe we would all like to be like that friend or neighbor whose character seems so ideal to us or like some favorite saint or preacher. But God didn't call us to be like them. 
He called us to be us and to become that new us within the very mess we have been, now transformed by the resurrection life of Jesus in us. See, when Jesus restores us, he does not superimpose his own being in such a way that we are type stamped like cookie cutter gingerbread creatures. Rather, his nature is still such a death of himself for us that he fills out what we are to be, which is uniquely and gloriously us. We are not robbed of anything we have been by our own personal crucifixion. We are fulfilled. His life fills our life's structure with his resurrection power to be the glory he intended from the first that we should be. See, there are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for star differs from star in glory so also is the resurrection of the dead 1 Corinthians 15 40 through 42 our delightful God reveals in variety how lovely are thy dwelling places O Lord of hosts Psalm 84 1 Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have from God and that you are not your own 1 Corinthians six nineteen, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit Ephesians two twenty two. God will never turn out one individual like another. No one can be replaced. Every child of God is unique, glorious in his own right, and needful to the whole. Therefore, a prayer minister or a lay leader does not build into another what the ministry or minister or leader thinks he ought to be. The greatest loss on earth would be a bunch of ricks and bobs and bills all acting identically. We fail if we produce clones. See, every believer stands by to watch as Jesus resurrects another into that unique wonder of creation God intended for him or her to be. That is the joy of being called to be a minister, watching the unique beauty of each butterfly emerge. As we said earlier, until inner death happens and the new creatures we are to emerge or to be emerged, the cycle of hate is not broken. Let me say it again. Until inner death happens and the new creatures we are to be emerge, the cycle of hate is not broken. Our old habit patterns continue to incite trouble both in others and us. And the battle is on again and again and again. Now, we add that even if we are in process of catching the deceptive games of the self in some areas. In other areas, we are but beginning or have not even started the labor of catching ourselves, checking our responses, and hauling them to the cross. See, there are no easy to come by saints. There is only perseverance. Hebrews 3, 14, and Hebrews 12, 1. Let but a momentary off-guardedness happen, and we are back into our outward battles. How tired of it we become. Peace does not fully come until we agree to allow the whole structure to be dealt with Though full in the inmost spirit, 
at the moment of conversion, peace does not settle into all our living until the entire inner being is submitted to the cross and the self is being transformed. Even so, the transformation depends upon the continued grace of our Lord's presence in us. If we walk dry apart from prayer, that arid condition becomes the ground of resurrection, not of the new, but the old. See, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee, Isaiah 26, 3. Mark carefully not that we stay the mind on him by determination or whatever power of the flesh we could beckon to the task, but the mind is stayed, is kept by the Lord, so that one who abides in him bears much fruit, John 15, 1-5. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9.23 The most common factor we deal with in prayer ministry is the fact of undead flesh in born anew Christians. Comprehension of crucifixion is crucial to the maturation of the body in Christ. Note, therefore, a difference. Physical death is apt to be something easy and quick, but crucifixion is slow and painful. Listen. Listen. Physical death is apt to be something easy and quick, but crucifixion is slow and painful. Evolvement is even slower and more painful. As there are no instant saints, neither are there sudden transformations. Listen. I saw a t-shirt that says the trouble with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. How true. We may have to suffer the embarrassment of failures numbers and numbers of times and so deeply that we can't stand what we are more than we fear death until we can't stand not dying to self. See, listen. We cannot very successfully put ourselves on the cross. We have to be impelled to it by the process he puts us through. If we could do it ourselves, we would never be able to escape the pride that we managed to become deader than the next fellow. Well, my friend, you will be as holy as I am when you have just managed to die enough. Listen. The Lord so engineers our salvation that though we have a part in it, we can never take credit for our own crucifixion. In Christ, all boasting is excluded. That no man should boast before God, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 29 through 31 only so does death and resurrection happen by the providence of God now let us see whether every Christian can hear what follows from that fact if it is the Holy Spirit who moves us by the grace of God's planning at the right time and way to our own personal crucifixion what have we to do with judging any brother for being when and where he is. We are tempted to anger by the stubborn slowness, even tardiness of others and us, but when we come to understand the way we all must come to crucifixion solely is by his timing, all hustle and demand die. 
For we see that God in his wisdom knows how to move us on the checkerboard of life. Can we blame a brother for being immature? Had God not persisted despite our stubbornness, there we would be also. Maybe it is not that fellow's time yet. Let it be only God who judges whether he is tardy and rebellious or not. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. John 21, 18. When Jesus spoke to Peter, he referred specifically to the time when men would carry Peter to be crucified upside down. But notice the context in, listen, notice the context in crucifixion and the text can be taken as a parable for us. When we were born anew and filled with the Spirit, we steamed ourselves up girded ourselves in our emotions and by our individual prayer life. We rushed here and there sharing this word and that, trying this and that gift to get our own ministry going. We went where we would. Maturity in Jesus means crucifixion, the point being that he accomplishes that crucifixion through the means of where others take us. We put forth our hands both to minister and to be ministered to, but others take hold of us and carry us where we would not, to death of self. We need to be encouraging others to stop fighting the people and circumstances God puts in our way. It may be those very incidents and people who carry us to our death which is most likely precisely why we do fight them. We may not be able to stop fighting. We may not like the whole process, but at least we understand it. And praise, and praise God for it, see, with gritted teeth perhaps. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, Job 13:15. We assert so often he is Lord. Do we really mean it? Do we really believe it? Does the unbelieving heart of a believer actually expect that his Lordship means that he will put us through the process? Perhaps we can learn nothing more valuable in all of life than to trust that he really is who he is and will accomplish what he has purposed to do, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that we should be holy and blameless. Ephesians 5:27. Now to him who is able to keep us and keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Jude 24 B. Hang on to your healing. We cannot close this chapter without teaching how to keep one's healing. There is a necessity to stand on faith. Once crucifixion is in process or being completed, we need to claim that fact by what we allow ourselves to feel, think, say, or do. We need to continue to reckon as dead that thing we prayed about. Many people go directly from healing prayer to attesting and Feeling that same old emotion, they conclude, oh, it didn't work. They may then plunge right back into all the same old feelings. Old habits will continue to sound off, like chime stones swinging in the wind. Listen, listen. But if we have taken a thing to the cross, that is all they are, mere sounds in the wind, having no force of reality behind them anymore.
They are truly dead, and we are made new. Listen, but if we believe they are still alive and plunge into struggling with them, we impart false life to those old crucified structures and wrestle unnecessarily all over again. A habit of jealousy or temper or being critical, whatever, will keep on flaring up having been prayed for. Listen, but if we have laid the axe, if we have laid the axe to it, to the root and prayed, that thing is in fact dead. If we let the continued recurrence of the old habit bother us, we can be stampeded only by ghosts and old empty haunted houses in our character. Listen, it is often merely because of that fact of unbelief and lack of self-discipline that believers fall back until the last state has become worse for them than the first. 2 Peter 2.20 if a believer struggling toward transformation believes that old thing still has reality, he will either give it energy by grappling with it or give in and flop back into the old habit. Neither is necessary. All he has to do is reject the old feeling, not fighting with it, merely saying, I don't have to have that anymore, that is dead, and then go on with life. Go on with the life he wants, ignoring contrary feelings from that point on, but make sure to say, I don't have to have that anymore in Jesus' name. Listen, or if it's a thought or an action, he needs only to reject the old thought or deed in Jesus' name from that point on, ignoring that thought and making himself act in a new way without bothering to question or quarrel with himself or even concern himself that the old thing still exists. Thus he gives it no reality, see, the old form in the flesh once dealt with can be likened to a swinging pendulum in a grandfather clock, the mainspring of which is broken. Listen, if we will let it alone and not hit the pendulum again, pretty soon it will wind down and quit. Or as with a bouncing ball, if we will quit dribbling it, it will eventually stop bouncing and roll to a stop. We must learn not to pay attention to dead symptoms. All our feelings have a life of their own and they do not want to die. Listen, our thoughts likewise fight not to perish. If we get in and fight with them, the feeling and thoughts will have a grand time plunging us into problem after problem after problem just to keep themselves alive and on center stage. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Romans 6, 12 through 14. Our minds and hearts do not want to be whole. They want to cook up crisis after crisis. Listen, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. Romans 8, 7. We haul such habits of mind and heart daily to death after prayer by acting the new life and ignoring the old signals. 
A woman came who could not give herself to her husband sexually after we found the roots and brought all the old stuff out in the old self structures to the cross, she still found herself tensing at her husband's approach. Her mind and feelings ran scattered like rebellious children. She leaned and learned not to fight her feelings or her mind or get mad at her continued failures. Rather, she said silently, I reject that in Jesus' name, and turned her attention in receiving her husband's touch in spirit. She was soon warm and loving and having a ball, and so was he. A woman came oppressed by feelings of worthlessness, loneliness, and self-pity. Having gotten at the roots, she had to learn not to let herself be tyrannized by continued recurrence of old feelings, and she made herself do things that distracted her mind from the symptoms. In a few weeks, she couldn't remember what she used to feel. A man came who could not spend time with his children and enjoy it. The roots being taken care of, he found that the new life he desired was no automatic gift. He had to take hold and make himself be with his children, play games, take walks, go fishing, and read stories to them, ignoring the pull of TV and all the old feelings and non-feelings. After a while, he was having so much fun with his children, he wondered why he never had discovered such joy before. A final point. We have found it to be a law that those who merely want pain removed do not get well. We have found it to be a law that those who merely want pain removed do not get well. Those who want to go on enjoying their own selfish, self-centered life never become free and happy. They only want to escape trouble. The very thing would, the very thing God would use to wake them up. Listen. So they can go on serving their own selfish God of mammon pleasure. They only want to escape trouble, the very thing God would use to wake them up. So they can go on serving their own selfish God of mammon pleasure. But those whose joy it is to lay their lives down in service of others are soon well and happy. The secret of life is in fact, to lose it. Luke 17, 33.